generosity and your giving. John chapter number 20 is where we're going to spend our time of preaching on this morning. Uh, this uh, resurrection and Easter morning, we are indeed uh, so grateful for uh, the gift of resurrection. And uh, we know that even as we uh, are spread across uh, potentially about 46 Bay Area cities, uh, here we know that the way literally is not only everywhere here in the Bay, but we are also spread across the country. <clears throat> so it's so, such a blessing. If you are out of uh, state uh, uh, worshiper, I would just love for you to put your city in the chat and let us know where you're watching from all across the country. And even if you are, you know, here in the Bay Area, everybody just, just tap in and just say uh, what city you're from. And so we can all just see that God is literally blessing us in our fellowship and that the body of Christ is literally without uh, limitation. The four walls of the church can't hold the magnanimity of God's body and God's church. And so help us to demonstrate that. Help that be a witness to all of the folks who are literally watching online. And we want to be a great blessing in Jesus' name. So we're going to take a, a, a quick uh, look in these particular texts today. I, I, I pulled John chapter 20, verse 1 through 18, and then also Jeremiah chapter number 31, verses 1 through 3. Both of these passages uh, will serve as the foundation for our preaching time this morning. And uh, certainly I uh, find them both to be uh, equally compelling and powerful for how we will make sense of Resurrection Sunday. And so uh, John chapter number 20, verse 1 through 18, and then we will close it out by just reading uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. Uh, the scripture reads along, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place all by itself. And then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. Verse number 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. And one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they had laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascend it to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. 
And she told them that he had said these things to her. Oh, my goodness, what a rich, rich passage. Uh, Turn with me uh, real quick to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families. Everybody say all the families. All the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword and found grace in the wilderness, when Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. This is indeed the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to speak from the topic just for a few moments today, resurrection on the loose resurrection on the loose. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And we ask you, God, to to let this power of resurrection be so near to us, so clear to us, God, that it will unleash within us a power we have yet to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Amen. Resurrection on the loose. Now, in times past, our celebration of Easter and resurrection, uh, particularly in the 21st century Western church, has been largely grounded in a rear view mirror reminding ourselves of the powerlessness of death. And while we've had in times past, and dare I say even right now, uh, had to wrestle with the persistent reality of death in our individual lives, sprinkled through the course of our life experience, We've not yet in at least our lifetime seen in the American context the concreteness of death through such corporate and communal impact as we have in the age of corona. Over 530,000 people have tested positive as of this morning of this plague that has literally ravaged not just our country but the world. And over 20,000 loved ones have died just in the last several months from this virus. And while the death related to COVID-19 has been indiscriminate, it still has been disproportionate. Black bodies enduring the weight of systemic and structural sin, poor souls and families that, that are continuously struggling under the weight of inequity and human hierarchy have accounted for more deaths than others. The underlying health conditions that uh, continue to exacerbate our engagement with this virus, coupled with our lack of access to health care, and the daily toll of being othered in the world through difference, has for far too many of us allowed the coronavirus to be a straw that has broken so many backs. But how many of you know that physical death is only one way that death visits our human experience? One of my mentors told me some time ago that there are a lot of ways to take someone's life without physically killing them. And in this season, we are seeing lives diminished. We are seeing people's worth uh, during this quarantine and shelter in place uh, put in peril. We see our loved ones in jails and prisons being subjected to some of the worst inhumane conditions. Folks being deprived of soap and food, medical care, being allowed to literally transition and die in the cells with their cellmates and put outside under tents in the courtyard. 
we see compassion being rationed out to them as if they are not worthy of life. We see in homes across the country, domestic and intimate partner violence is diminishing the humanity of the victims and even the abuser. That in this moment and season, our young people who in many contexts have relied on school as an escape or a reprieve from abusive parents or challenging dynamics at home now lack stability, don't have access to food, nor the tender touch of friends and other loving adults. I'm here to tell you that on this day, Resurrection Day, Easter 2020, if we've ever needed to turn resurrection loose in all its power and all its relevance, we need resurrection today more than ever before. Oh, you ought to just say, I need resurrection today more than I've ever needed it before. Because as we've come to declare in every season of our lives, regardless of whether it's Easter or resurrection in our liturgical calendar, we know that as a follower of Jesus, we can declare that death does not have the final say. This is a confession that we make. It is a truth that we proclaim even when we can't fully understand the scriptures. Oh, I love it in this passage when they went to the tomb and they did not see Jesus there. The text says that this happened even though they did not fully understand. I want you to just understand and appreciate that resurrection will happen in your life even if you don't fully understand how. That resurrection power is not predicated on your ability to fully understand, but it is solely grounded in the power and the promise of God. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is raising every one of us from our dead situations, no matter how they show up, in your life. Do I have any witnesses out there that can just look in the rear view mirror and say, I can recall how Jesus' power has raised me up over and over and over again. Now, now I must admit that the historical nature of our tradition is a gift to me and even all of us during this very challenging season because we don't have to start from theological scratch, as they say. You know, I've never been, I was talking to a friend, and she was telling me how, you know, she makes uh, cakes and cookies and, and all these things from scratch. You know, she don't believe in recipes, amen. She, she just knows how to put it together, amen, because she's from the South. I think she said Mississippi or, or Louisiana somewhere, and she just got that stuff in her bones, I want you to know that you don't have to start from scratch to try to figure out theologically or liturgically how to address the inquiries and the questions this season of death and resurrection attempt to clarify. You don't have to wonder how grief is in, in relation to your faith. You don't have to even wonder how you are to process your death, but we have a historical tradition that gives you and I some road maps. I was reading 4th century a uh, North African church father by the name of Athanasius. Uh, they called this, this brother the black dwarf, which makes me believe and know that if he's from Africa and he's a black dwarf, then he must have been a black man. Somebody say amen. So you got a 4th century black man trying to make sense of all of the inconsistencies of both death and life at work. And this is what Athanasius says, all of the disciples of Christ must despise death. They take the offensive against it. And instead of fearing death, by the sign of the cross and by faith in Christ, they trample on it as on something dead. Ooh, I, I, I almost ran all through my office yesterday just imagining what does it mean for me as a follower of Jesus to take these words seriously. 
that death is something I and we should despise. But it is also something that we have the power to take offensive against. That we don't have to allow death to be assaulting us without us bringing a offensive against death itself. Oh, and, 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 and then I love how he said that, that you must trample on death as if you are already stepping on something that's dead. That the ultimate uh, reality, the inevitability of death does not have to result in triggering the paralysis of the saints. That death, even though it may be inevitable, does not mean we have to be paralyzed by it. Death may cause us to grieve, but it won't cause us to fear it. Death may cause us to reflect, but it won't cause us to forget. Death may cause us even at times to doubt. But like I believe Karl Barth says, doubt is the confirmation of your faith. So even when I am doubting as the child of God, it does not mean I have to lose my faith. That's a word for somebody going through some very death-filled situations, both in the physical, the spiritual, the relational, the, the mental, the, 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 all the different kinds. You may have doubt in this season, but it does not mean you have to lose your faith. Because as many saints have gone before us, we can join in their ongoing quest to despise death, to trample on death, and dare I say to go on an offense against death itself. And that's what I want to talk about today. How you and I, even in the months and weeks and days to come, will deal with the concreteness of death and those agents who knowingly and unknowingly deliver death to our front doors through the coronavirus, through inept leadership, what does it mean for us to put resurrection on the loose? It takes us to our text today. For this day, the prophet Jeremiah and the apostle John, both attempting to make sense of the presence and the, 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 the consistency of death uh, in their context, they understand what death and abandonment feels like in real time. And at different points of the historical trajectory of the faithful, Jeremiah speaks to the Jews who have endured exile and find themselves still wandering in the wilderness. And John, the apostle, the one whom Jesus loves, speaking to disciples who are living under the thumb of the Roman Empire in a post-resurrection context. I want you to hear this. You have one voice speaking to those who are in exile. You have another voice speaking to those living in empire. And the lived reality of both exile and empire are concrete conditions that often describe so many human and spiritual conditions at work both inside of us and around us. That while exile works by keeping you and I separated from ourselves, from home, from safety, from community, exile causes us to feel like we are lost. Wandering through perpetual wilderness moments. And we, like the suffering servant in Isaiah, become overly acquainted with grief. We become familiar with disappointment and trouble, exile within. But there's also a way that empire works within us, that some of us have internalized the ugliness of oppression, the, the diabolical nature of hegemonic power, force, and, and violence, that through bondage and fear, perpetuated upon us by the systems and powers of human hierarchy and white supremacy, we have, in many respects, made empire have a cultivating presence inside of us. Just like the virus thrives on mucus within you, 
Some of us have allowed empire to, to thrive within us and given us over to the very forces that we are being set free from. But then we know and we must acknowledge that outside of us, particularly in the age of corona, we feel like we are in exile. Even though many of us literally are physically at home every day, our normal has been interrupted. We don't recognize the rhythms and the realities that we are facing. And this dissonance causes us to ask questions we thought were already settled. It makes us rethink circumstances we thought we had already resolved. And so the empire around us is demonstrating its ability to perfect the art of death through its ap apathy and recklessness and warlike approaches to conditions that the empire itself has helped to foster. So we have exile within us. We have empire within us. We have exile outside of us and we have empire outside of us. That is why in our work I've tried to invite us as people of faith and goodwill, folks with a moral center, to cease from using the language of war to make meaning and describe our current response. For in war, our primary tools are violence and weapons. We make enemies of people in war. We, we don't know who these folks are, but we find a way to be at at opposition with them. We often create binaries when we are in war that exclude people rather than expand. But what if we truly saw this season as a opportunity, an invitation, and an initiation into a new way of life? A way of life that is grace-filled. A way of life that is radically generous to one another. A way of life where through our eyes of faith and our acts in the spirit, we set resurrection loose on death. Whenever and however death shows up. Oh, you ought to, you ought to just say that I want to set resurrection loose on death. I want resurrection not to be chained to an Easter Sunday, but I want resurrection to be loosed in every circumstance. Because quiet as it's kept, while death is always lingering, I, be, I think we have a few testimonies in here that can say resurrection is always hanging out, waiting to be unleashed on our dead situations. I wonder if you can look back and see how the constant power of resurrection has always been at work in your life. I wonder if you can uh, just just remind yourself pre-corona days how Jesus showed up in your death-filled context and breathed a breath of life that gave you the strength to keep on pushing. Lord, I wish I had somebody who had a good memory of how Jesus showed up and brought you back from the brink to remind you that death does not have the final say. Now more than ever, you need to tell yourself if he did it before, he can do it again. He's the same God right now as he was back then. Uh, so, so just testify in the chat. How is resurrection being loosed in your life? How is resurrection showing up in your past and in your present? Because this is indeed how you remind yourself and proclaim to yourself, I can, I will, and I must put resurrection on the loose. Uh, let, me, let me get to the text. So John's account of the resurrection morning describes Mary Magdalene, one of these courageous, uh, I call them first responders, Lord have mercy, who show up to the tomb, a place of death. And the scripture says while it was still dark, she was showing up looking for Jesus. Oh, I find it to be the case that resurrection on the loose allows us to not only look for Jesus in the light, but resurrection on the loose causes us to look for Jesus in dark places. And the resurrection on the loose, listen, also gives you and I power to see in the dark. 
Lord, I wish I had some folk up in here who understands what it means to see in the dark. Just say it with me. Resurrection lets me see in the dark. Mary, a first responder in the resurrection story, immediately sanctifies and turns on its head the kind of qualifications and selection process many of us would, would use in order to decide who would be the first herald of this new world order. As a woman in a society that was more patriarchal than the one we got today. A woman who was indeed seen more as property than as human. A woman whose very vulnerability was always at stake. A woman who knew that if she showed up to a tomb of a convicted killer of the empire, that there undoubtedly would be soldiers there who could at any moment jump upon her and cause her just as much harm as the harm done to Jesus. But yet this woman who you could imagine the stigma and the fear she had to push through to respond to the death of the one who had in many ways responded to her first. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, gee, yeah, 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 you got to appreciate that she showed up in the dark, seeing through the dark, probably because Jesus showed up for her before and saw through her own dark places. Her own vulnerabilities and trauma and stigma and negation that at its core, Jesus showed up for her first, which gave her the courage to show up at the tomb in the dark for Jesus. Uh, at its core, resurrection gives you and I the ability to develop night vision. The, the ability to see through the dark nights of the soul. It gives you and I the ability to see through the dark nights of the body, through the dark nights of the spirit. It puts you and I on a front row for the divine surprises infused with another set of eyes and expectations. It puts you and I in a place where resurrection allows us to see in the dark as we become first responders in our homes and hospitals. It allows you and I to see in the dark as we respond to death and reimagine the kind of responses that we would think are magnanimous, that are beyond us, that, that are normalized. We say no through the eyes and the power of resurrection on the loose. I can respond differently when I am encountering death. I mean, think of this. Jesus followers, not all of them were touched by resurrection on the loose at the same time. Some of his disciples still mourning and hiding out in their homes. Uh, those were natural responses to the reality of both the external and internal conditions. Yet this woman named Mary so deeply touched by the Savior, had already cultivated a love and a courage and a radical solidarity to wade through the dark and visit the tomb. Oh, I just wonder, as we confront death in all its many forms, I want you to know that God has given you some night vision. God has given you the ability to see in your dark season uh, the power and possibility of stumbling onto a resurrected moment. Uh, Mary didn't expect resurrection when she showed up, but she showed up, stumbled into a miracle. And when resurrection is on the loose, Tombs and graveyards and hospitals and relationships, your physical and mental health, even this wicked empire, all of these things can become agents of death and despair. But I want you to know the resurrection of Jesus allows you and I to tap into the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It can be at work in you and I. And it gives you and I. Night vision. Lord, I, I wish you understood this night vision the way I understood it. Uh, uh, I wish you could see what God is doing in the dark even right now. What then are the opportunities to confront death? Not with paralyzing fear. Not with paralyzing grief. But now you and I on resurrection morning can make a pivot to, to confront death with compassion. 
confront death with care and radical solidarity as mirrored by Mary Magdalene. I'm here to tell you that if you can see through the darkness of death, you can develop a new superpower. Oh, I, I hope the church emerges out of this season of Corona with a new superpower, not a superpower where we master technology or we become a better brand or we become a better way to, to, to entertain people through church and slogans. But I pray we emerge with a new superpower that allows us to see in the dark. So we can perfect our desire to have 2020 vision. Uh, I want you to know when you see in the dark, you got a whole nother level of 2020 vision. You can see in and through death the possibilities and inevitability of a new and emerging life. I dare you right now to tell yourself how you need resurrection to be turned loose in your life right now. I need it in my family. I need it in my body. I need it in my mind. I need it on my job. I need it in my country. Turn resurrection a loose. Uh, Patrick Sutherland and Chester say, I got my night vision on. I got my night vision on, and I'm going to learn how to see through the dark, even in the age of Corona. Oh, uh, somebody clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Uh, the second thing that the text gives us is this truth that death is a doorway, not a dead end. Death is a doorway. Say that with me. Death is a doorway, not a dead end. Ooh, as Mary comes to the tomb and sees the emptiness that characterizes the tomb, Mary runs to tell Peter and John, who in turn run to the tomb to see it for themselves. Mary sees the empty tomb and she starts running. Peter and John hear about the empty tomb, and they start running. What if you allowed the empty tomb to be a catalyst for you to keep running? You ought to just in your, in your room just right now. Just, I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to keep running. I'm going to keep running. Why? Because the empty tomb is not a dead end. It's a doorway that allows you to keep running, to go run and tell it that it's empty. Death has lost his power, or to run to see it. I got to see it for myself. Death, listen, and empty tombs are not dead ends. They are doorways that invite us to emerge with a different way of being. In this season, so many of us are confronting some of our worst fears, some of our worst selves, and the fear of the tomb is robbing us from the gift of the tomb. The fear of the tomb of death is robbing some of us of the potential gift of the tomb. For in encountering an empty tomb, Mary and the disciples, listen, see vestiges of clothes that could not hold the resurrected body of Jesus. They see the very limitations of not only death, but the very garments that death would like to wrap us up in. Death thinks it's a final verdict, but it's actually a penultimate moment to something new. Who could it be that resurrection in the age of Corona gives us an opportunity to explore the newness that comes from the gift of the tomb? The things that must stay in the tomb that can't rise with the new you. The things that must stay in the tomb that can't rise with the new society we must build. The things that stay in the tomb that the new world must create anew. For at its core, it is the truth that death exhausts all that sustains us. Does not death result after the body gives way to lethal trauma? Death results as our organs are exhausted and crumble under the internal weight of trauma and unbearable stress. So listen, we need resurrection to give us a new body. A new way of life, a new way forward. So the path that brought us to this moment of death at its best could only produce what it has produced. 
Would you uh, appreciate with me the words of Pope Francis this morning, who, as a part of his Easter message, gave homage to the essential workers, to the first responders, to everyday people who still are showing up to tombs and graveyards at times with little choice. Sanitation worker, nurses and doctors, outreach workers, uh, correction officers, folks who are still showing up to places even though they know that they may be at risk. And he goes on to say that part of this moment must catalyze us to offer a new social vision that must be the radical rethinking of our social and human contract with one another. That how can we declare people are essential workers in a time of death and we won't allow them a wage that supports their family? That our response politically is still to bail out wealthy wealthy corporate leaders and leave the rest of us to argue and squabble over $1,200 and $10,000 and, and, and paycheck uh, re reimbursements. I want you to know that that is a death-filled response. And so Pope Francis, I join with him and declare that this new world informed by an empty tomb compels us to imagine, dare I say, reimagine how we build a new society that leaves in the tomb a predatory capitalistic economy that leaves in the tomb patriarchy and sexism, that leaves in the tomb a work week and a schedule that strains familial relationships, that leaves in the tomb a profit-driven healthcare system that rations care to the needy, uh, 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 a way to leave in the tomb racism and homophobia and war and ecological devastation. Dare I say, what would it look like for us to emerge? from the empty tomb and say, like Pope Francis said today, we ought to have a universal basic income that catches up with the truth that all humans deserve basic provisions in a world God created with enough for all of creation to flourish. <laughs> that coming out of the empty tomb, we're going to have a new economy. <laughs> that coming out of the empty tomb, we're going to have a new politic. <laughs> that coming out of the empty tomb, we're going to have a new world. <laughs> and coming out of the empty tomb, I see myself rising. <laughs> You ought to say that uh, when the chatter to yourself, I see myself rising. <laughs> Coming out of this empty tomb, I see my household. <laughs> I see my community. <laughs> I see my circumstance rising. <laughs> and that brings me to Jeremiah chapter 31, <laughs> verse number one through three. <laughs> the prophet says that at the same time, the Lord said, I will be the God of all the families. I will be the God of all the families of Israel. And they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord. The people who survived the sword. The people who survived Corona. The people that survived the empire. They found grace in the wilderness. When the people sought for rest. The Lord appeared to them. He appeared from far away. The Lord popped up just like he popped up on Mary. Mary was in the garden. She didn't know where Jesus was. But Mary, knowing that something must have happened, she told the gardener, who took the body of my Savior. I'm here to tell you today that just like Jesus popped up on Mary and Mary didn't know Jesus was there, I want you to appreciate that Jesus is ready through this new resurrection to pop up on you when you find yourself in your wilderness or find yourself in the garden. Just like Mary, I may not recognize the grace. I may not recognize the Messiah when he pops up because I got to train my eyes to see this new Jesus. I got to train my heart to love this new Jesus. I got to train my soul uh, to interact in.
in this new world. At first, I won't recognize it. It'll be a mystery to me. It'll feel like a burden. But I know when Jesus calls my name, just like he called the name Mary, Mary recognized a voice she heard deep down in her soul. Mary recognized that I have seen the Lord. Ah, I have seen the Lord. I want you to know that Jesus wants resurrection to visit your house, to visit your relationship, to visit your circumstance, to visit your neighborhood, to visit our country. He wants to set it loose, and it will guarantee that we will see the Lord. He'll show up with you uh, as a resurrected power uh, whether you are in the exile uh, of the wilderness uh, or in living uh, out a failed existence uh, in the empire uh, he will appear uh, from afar off uh, but the closer he gets uh, open up your ears uh, and just start to listen uh, for the Lord uh, who will call you by name for the Lord who will say resurrection is within your grasp. Then you can join with the saints that said, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face there to see forever of his saving grace. Walk the streets of glory. Let me live my voice. Cares all past. Home at last, ever to rejoice, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know, I know, I know who holds the future, life is worth the living just, because he lives, shout hallelujah. We must emerge from the empty tomb with a resurrection that is on the loose. You can't get to resurrection without going through the cross and the tomb. But you can come out of the tomb with a new way of living, a new resurrected body, a new resurrected mindset, a new resurrected consciousness. Oh, I want you people of God to not allow this season to cheapen the, 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 the seriousness of the death and grief we all will endure. Don't cheapen it. The death of Jesus was ugly. The death of Jesus was violent. The death of Jesus, he endured sexual assaults. He endured physical assaults. His, his mind was tortured. His body was broken. It was ugly. So the ugliness of this moment need not be diminished. The challenge in your life need not be diminished in order for resurrection to be loosed. No, resurrection has the power, hallelujah, to take whatever circumstance we are in in your body, the, the illness in your body, the, the, the illness and the struggle in your mind, the brokenness in your spirit. Resurrection is here. So you don't have to be afraid of the tomb. Woo, the power of God is waiting for you in the tomb to show you that at the end of this process, it will be an empty tomb. There will be things left behind in that tomb. 
but it won't be that which is declared to live. We shall live and not die to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds my future. And life is worth the living just because. God, we ask you right now, Lord, live. Live through the power of your resurrection. Yes. May we know, God, that resurrection was not a one-time phenomena. It was not a one-time miracle. But it is the expression of a perpetual victory. That even though, God, death is at work among us and around us, life is at work within. So, God, as we mourn those who have transition during this season may we set resurrection loose on our grief as we mourn the life that is changing may we set resurrection loose on this life may we God go on an offensive assault not through just a spiritual religious set of practices but God may we practice as our assault on death Radical generosity, radical love, radical charity, radical inclusion, Lord God. May we bring near to those who have been left apart and separate. May we respond to our neighbor, Lord God, who may be living in a tomb themselves. May we, God, respond with, Lord, a set of night goggles, a night vision that allows us like Mary was able to see through the dark to get to the tomb. May we God, like Mary Magdalene, have night goggles so we can see through the darkness that may be existing in our neighbors, our families, even in this culture. So God, we declare and decree today that we will set resurrection on the loose. We will not allow death to win in our hearts. We will shed a tear, Lord God, but resurrection will turn that tear into anointing. We may grieve, but resurrection will turn that grief into hope. Lord God, we may suffer losses, but resurrection will turn those losses into a new doorway for the next phase that must emerge. And we'll say, thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, let's thank God. Let's thank God for the resurrection.